about 2,500 years ago when Cyrus the Great cobbled together a loose band of tribes in modern-day northern Iraq. He formed a tremendously powerful Persian Empire, and his army conquered an incredible amount of land. And then after that, Alexander the Great came along with his Macedonian army, and he conquered the Persians and expanded that kingdom all the way to India before dying at the ripe old age of 32. And shortly thereafter, at least historically speaking, came the Romans, a terrible and fierce kingdom of iron that for centuries conquered and absorbed practically every land and people they encountered. And every one of these ancient kingdoms had something in common. They had a banner. They had a symbol that represented that kingdom. Now, when you and I think of a banner, we probably think of something like what's on the wall behind me, a a 10-foot-long piece of cloth that indicates a sermon series. But in ancient times, the ancient prophets didn't have banners such like that to indicate what sermon series they were in. Um, The banners of that day in ancient times, they weren't just displayed on a wall in a sanctuary to the faithful, but... What they were, were either pieces of cloth or actual symbols of metal. They were symbols that were lifted high on poles so the entire army could see them. And not only could their own army see these symbols, but so could the opposing army. And so when Cyrus the Great conquered, out on a symbol on a pole was the symbol of a a great falcon. And it symbolized the swiftness and the ferocity with which his army would attack the enemy. And just like a falcon swoops in and sinks its talons into a rabbit before that rabbit even sees it, that's what Cyrus the Great's army will do to you. And then you had the son of Alexander the Great. And this symbol symbolized the totality and the expanse of nature of his army's attack. And and just as a person cannot escape the light of the sun in midday, neither will you escape the far-reaching destruction of Alexander the Great's army. And finally, you had the Romans. The Romans had this symbol, and we would look at these letters as S-P-Q-R. That's how we would read it. And it was, a, it was an abbreviation for Senatus Populusque Romanus, meaning the Roman Senate and people. And it was a reminder to any army that dared to fight against the Romans of the power of the Roman Empire, that it did not lie in one mortal man, but, but rather in the collective whole of all of the people. And so even if an opposing army were to kill the leader of the Romans, a seemingly infinite number of others were able to replace him, and to fight against such an army would simply be a hopeless endeavor. Well, today, we've replaced this idea of a banner. The modern equivalent is a flag, of course. And so when you see the U.S. flag on a Navy vessel out at sea, it's a symbol of the strength of the entire nation. Or if you were to visit the Iwo Jima Memorial in Washington, D.C., you'd be reminded of the heroic efforts needed to defeat a tyrannical nation in World War II. Now, can you imagine a nation not having a flag? A nation not having a banner? I mean, can you imagine some ancient army going into battle and not being able to look up and to see that there's this symbol that we rally around and we fight for. But that's exactly what happened to ancient Israel after they escaped slavery in Egypt. They faced a brand new enemy shortly thereafter when they left Egypt, and it was the Amalekites. And yet they had no banner. I invite you to take your Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 17. In Exodus chapter 17... Exodus is the second book of the Bible. Exodus chapter 17, beginning in verse 8, and reading on through verse 16, here's what we read. At a place called Rephidim, 
Amalek came and fought against Israel. Moses said to Joshua, Select some men for us and go fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the hilltop with God's staff in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Moses held up his hand. And while he did so, Israel prevailed, but whenever he put his hand down, Amalek prevailed. When Moses' hands grew heavy, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat down on it. Then Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until the sun went down. So Joshua defeated Amalek. And his army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this down on a scroll as a reminder, and recite it to Joshua. I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. And Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. He said, Indeed, my hand is lifted up toward the Lord's throne. The Lord will be at war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, there is a, a wonderful lesson in this story that we're not going to spend any time discussing, but I'll go ahead and tell you what it is. Here it is, real quick. Moses needed others when he grew tired, okay? Moses needed others when he grew tired, and that's a lesson for all of us. There are times when every one of us might grow weary. And we need others to figuratively hold our hands up when our hands are too weary to be held up on their own. In fact, there are many times in every pastor's ministry, including my own, when the pastor needs others. I need others to lift me up in prayer when the burdens of being a pastor wear me down and take a toll. And I'm very grateful for this church for so many reasons, but one of those being that there are people here who pray for their pastor every day. And I'm very grateful for that. Like I said, that's a lesson for another day, and we're not going to spend any time on that. What I want to spend time on is the stick, the staff in Moses' hand. Moses stands on a hilltop, he holds the stick up, he gets some, some support from his assistants, and Israel wins the battle. Why does Israel win? Because Moses holds the stick up in the air, obviously, right? Now, of course, we've already read the end of the story. We know that it was actually the Lord who won the battle because Moses gives credit to the Lord in the end. But here's my question. Why didn't God just win the battle some other way? I mean, why didn't God just simply sort of stay in the background, stay hidden in the backgrounds, and sort of give a little bit of extra juice to the, to the Israelites? Give them a little bit of extra power, you know? Why, why couldn't he just have done that? What's the deal with the stick? Why was the stick important? Why, what's the deal with the staff in Moses' hand? Well, to be sure, God certainly could have won the battle any way he wanted, Right? I mean, if God can produce a victory by using an 80-year-old man holding a stick up in the air, then God can produce a victory pretty much any way he wants, right? Okay, and so after all, God is God. But God chose a very particular and peculiar way to win this victory. And once again, it is in the peculiarities of the stories of the Bible, that the richest treasures of life are to be found. So what's up with the stick? Well, as some of you already know, this was not just any stick. It was a staff. And I don't know if it exactly looked like this. I don't know if it was a shepherd's staff. Technically, a shepherd's staff is a different word in Hebrew, but 
It very well may have been a shepherd's staff. But it wasn't just any staff. The staff that Moses had actually belonged to somebody else other than Moses. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 9, read it again. It says, Moses said to Joshua, Select some men for us and go fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the hilltop with God's staff in my hand. The staff was the staff of God. Now, how did this come to be? How did this staff become God's staff? Well, when God first met with Moses at the burning bush, and he told Moses to go to Egypt and to free the Israelites from their slavery, he asked Moses a very simple question. Here was the question in Exodus chapter 4, verse 2. What is that in your hand? A staff, Moses replied. And then God instructed Moses to throw the staff on the ground, and it became a snake. And then God instructed Moses to pick up the snake by the tail, and it became a staff again. And the Lord said, Take this staff in your hand that you will perform the signs with. And then we read later in Exodus chapter 4, verse 20. So Moses took his wife and sons, and he put them on a donkey, and returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took God's staff in his hand. Did you catch that? In Exodus 4, 2, it was a staff. But by verse 20, when Moses was ready to obey, it became God's staff. What made the difference? It was simply this. Moses obeyed God with what was in his hand. Moses allowed his possession to be used by God. So let me ask you a question today. This sermon will not take long at all, because we're going to get right to the point. What is in your hand? What do you have that you will allow God to use for His glory? And that is the difference between something being a staff or something being God's staff. It is your willingness to allow what you have to be used for God's glory. You see, once the staff became God's staff, this is what God did with it through Moses. Moses took the staff and he struck the Nile River and it was turned to blood. And the Bible says that the fish in the Nile died. And the river smelled so bad, the Egyptians could not drink water from it. Aaron's staff, which also became a staff of God, was stretched over the rivers, over the canals, over the ponds, and frogs came up and covered the land. And when the frogs died, they were piled in countless heaps. And there was a terrible odor throughout Egypt. And then Aaron took his staff and he struck the dust of the land. And a plague of gnats covered all of the people and the animals of Egypt. And then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven. And lightning struck the land. And the Lord rained hail on Egypt. And the hail struck down on both people and animals. It beat down every plant and shattered every tree of the field. And then Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt. And the Lord sent an east wind over the land that brought in a plague of locusts. And they covered the surface of the whole land, Scripture says, so that the land was black 
And they consumed all of the plants on the ground and all of the fruit on the trees that the hail had left until there was nothing green throughout the land of Egypt. And finally, after escaping Egypt and being trapped by Egypt's army at the Red Sea, the Lord instructed Moses, Lift up your staff, stretch your hand out over the sea, and divide it so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I want you to consider what it must have been like to have been an Israelite who witnessed all of that that God did with a stick. And now, you're being attacked by the Amalekites. You have no city walls to defend you. You have no metalsmiths who've been working for months to pile up a storehouse of weapons to defend you. You have no chariots to outrun and outflank the enemy. How in the world is this battle going to be won? It'll only be won one way. It will be won only because you have something that has been dedicated to the God who gives us the victory. You have the staff in Moses' hand. Listen. Today, if you've been going through a struggle, you've been going through a fight, you've been going through a battle, and it seems like you've been facing defeat after defeat after defeat, and you're asking the question, where is my victory, God? I would humbly submit to you that the reason the victory is elusive for you is not because of the Lord. I do not believe that your battle, whatever you're going through, is too much for God to handle. I do not believe that God has, is somehow lacking in having enough power or somehow he's too limited in his knowledge or he somehow lacks the abilities to give you the victory. I do not believe that about God because this is what the scripture says about God. In Deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 4, For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. Proverbs 21, verse 31 says, A horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory comes from the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 15, we read, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, we read, Everyone who has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. Romans 8, 37 says, In all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Listen, if you're not experiencing victories... It is not due to some failure or deficiency on God's part. Either the victory is yet to come, or there's something you have not yet given over to the Lord. If your wealth, for example, is the instrument God wants to use to give you victory, you cannot, in your heart and mind, consider your wealth to be your own and off-limits to God. It just doesn't work that way. If the instrument that God wants to use to give you victory is, let's say, your job, then you must give your job over to the Lord for Him to use as He desires. If the instrument that God wants to use is your car, or your house, or your family, or your skills, or your abilities, or your experiences, or even just a stick in your hand, 
you must make sure first that whatever the instrument is, it is not yours, but it is God's. You cannot say to God, give me victory with a closed, clenched fist and a death grip on what is in your hand, whatever it may, it, whatever it may be. You cannot do it that way. When the Lord asks you the question that he asked Moses, what is in your hand? It is implied that you open it up and release it to God. God, use me. God, use my wealth, my job, my family, my abilities. Use my speech, my sight, my hearing. Use my understanding. Use my lifestyle. Use the club that I'm a part of, the sports team that I'm a part of. Use whatever it is that I have, that I've been keeping for myself keeping at arm's length from you, and use it, God, for your glory. And only when you turn it over to the Lord will that possession become not yours, but God's. And only when you turn it over to the Lord will God be able to use that possession in a way that you've never even anticipated. Whether you are the widow who can only make soup and all you have is a spoon in your hand, let that spoon be God's. Whether you are like my own mother, someone who loved to play Scrabble, let those Scrabble tiles be God's. And let God receive glory through your playing of that game. No matter what you are, no matter what you have, the little bit or the lot that you have for God. He wants to use it. But you have to get to the point where you say it's yours, not mine. If that causes you fear, overcome it. If that causes you concern and worry, deal with it. Otherwise, you're essentially telling God, I'm the one in charge, not you. And that is a very dangerous, very unfortunate place for you to be. It's much easier, much wiser, much more glorious to God and better for you if you simply say, here I am. Use me. Here's everything that I have. Use it for you. And once the staff of God is given over to the Lord, it becomes His, and He will do glorious things with it. And it is then, and only then, that Moses was able to hold up the stick that God did all of this with and name that place, The Lord is my banner. Because that is when God will fight for you.